Kaylee from Roma University. He will talk about the master equation in MIFID games with the new man condition. Please go ahead, Kaylee. Okay, thank you, Mohamed, and thank you to all the organizers for the invitation. So today we'll talk about uh, the mean field games and in particular the master equation in mean field games uh, in a framework of Neumann boundary conditions. So we start with a brief introduction, uh, especially for those who uh, hasn't worked with mean field games. So, so to see what is this mean field games and in particular, what is this master <laughs> equation? Then we will talk about, uh, we will give some preliminaries and assumptions about the problem with Neumann condition. So the stochastic interpretation, all the uh, notations and the tools we have to use. And uh, of course the hypothesis needed. Then we will prove the well-posedness of the master equation and uh, the convergence problem. The convergence problem will be more clear after the introduction. So to explain what is this convergence problem. Okay, so we can start with a brief introduction about mean field games. So mean field games theory is a branch of mathematics which was introduced in 2006 by Jean-Michel Lasserie and Pierre Lillions uh, in order to describe the behavior of Nash equilibria in differential games with a large number of agents. Uh, in general, for the approximation, it is supposed to be a population, so infinitely many agents. So the aim of the mean field games is to describe the behavior of mass, mass of rational players. Okay, so we, ha we have our framework of non-cooperative differential games. Uh, the number of players, uh, also called agents, uh, is, uh, is denoted with capital N, and each agent chooses his own strategy and place its dynamic in order to minimize a certain cost functional or maximize a certain gain. The dynamic of the player I is described by the following stochastic differential equation, where we have an initial time T0, an initial position X0I, for now just in RD, and we have a control for the player I, which is called alpha TI, then B and sigma are the drift term and the diffusion matrix. Of course, capital B as classical in stochastic equation is uh, um, a set of uh, independent dimensional Brownian motions. <coughs> the cost function for the player I is given by the following functional. So we have a Lagrangian cost uh, for the control, which depends just on the position of the player I and its own control. And then we have uh, two cost functions, which are uh, a running cost F, which depends on the whole trajectory of all the players, and the final cost G, which depends on the final position of all the players. A fundamental tool here is given by uh, the Nash equilibrium. So we say that a control alpha star provides a Nash equilibrium if for all controls alpha and for all players i, this inequality holds. What does this mean? It means that uh, uh, each player has no interest to be the only one uh, to change the strategy. So each player minimizes its cost, provided the other players are frozen at the optimal control. So you see alpha star remains also in the right-hand side term for the other players, and I change just the control of the player I. If I change for the player I, I change the control, uh, the cost for the player I is greater. So is, in the Nash equilibrium, it is playing the optimal cost, the optimal control. The value function is defined classically as the cost functional evaluated at the optimal cost, at the optimal control, at the Nash equilibrium. And uh, if we compute uh, the equation uh, satisfied by BNI using Ito's formula and the dynamic programming principle, we can prove that alpha star provides a Nash equilibrium if the related function BNI solve this system, which is called the Nash system. It's a system of parabolic Hamilton-Jacobi-Bellman equation backward, 
with a final condition. And uh, here we have uh, A, which is defined by sigma, sigma star. Sigma was the diffusion matrix, and it is the matrix that appears applying Ito's formula. H is the Hamiltonian of the system, defined in this way. is a slight modification of the convex conjugate. Actually, if B is minus alpha, is exactly the convex conjugate. OK, uh, this system, uh, the structure of this system is really complicated if the number of players is large. Why? Because we have n partial differential equation, one for each i. And this equation lies in R and D. So the dimension of the space increases if the number of the player is larger. And also, uh, they are uh, strongly coupled because uh, uh, you see from here that the equation of VNI depends on all VNJ. So since this structure is really complicated, uh, the idea of the Lyons is to simplify this Nash system uh, when the number of the player is really large, uh, provided, of course, some suitable symmetry conditions for the agents and their dynamics. And the system born to simplify the Nash system is called mean field gain system. So we need some symmetry conditions. So we suppose that capital F and capital G are of this form. <coughs> so actually, for the player I, the cost function do not depend on the position of all the player, but just on the position of the player I. And the dependence on the position of the other player is also from this uh, empirical measure, so empirical distribution of the other player defined in this way, where delta is the Dirac masses. And it means basically that uh, for the player I, uh, it does not depend, it, it depends just, uh, the cost depends just on the distribution of the population. So if I swap a player J and player K, uh, the cost for the player I is exactly the same. Okay, and um, if we compute at least heuristically uh, the limit when n tends to plus infinity, we find uh, the following mean field game system, uh, where the, we have a coupled uh, partial differential equation, a Hamilton Jacobi equation backward, coupled with a forward Fokker Planck equation. The Hamilton Jacobi equation is for the value function, and it is coupled with a forward. Uh, back a uh, forward for Kerplank equation for the distribution of the population M. Actually, uh, this limit uh, is, um, is just an heuristic limit. The proof of the convergence, so, uh, rigorous can, convergence. Can I ask, a, uh, yes. can I ask a question? Okay, yeah. so M, I understand how M is related. To, so, so can you go back the previous uh, slide? Yeah. But, so, so M, I can understand what is M, but how is U related to the V, I, N? Well, actually, U and then U and V are more related because uh, V is the value function for uh, the Nash system, for the system yeah. with the N players, and U is the value function for the generic player of a population. So uh, in the asymptotic formulation, actually, we have... Uh, uh, the same law for all the players because the players are assumed to be undistinguishable with the symmetry hypothesis. And actually, uh, we have the equilibrium and the value function is defined as the cost function played at the optimal control. So U is more related to V than M. M is the distribution of the population. But it will become clearer actually with the master equation because uh, uh, the limit problem, uh, the rigorous proof for uh, the limit problem, uh, in general, is hard to obtain uh, just with the mean field game system due to some lack of compactness of the system. So the idea of Las Rielions to rigorously, rigorously describe this limit is to introduce this new equation, which is the master equation, and which summarizes the mean field game system in a unique <coughs> equation. Excuse me, so, uh, yeah. to, I didn't uh, to understand well. When you said limit, it's when n go to infinity or the long time behavior? Or... 
No, no, no. The end goes to infinity. It is not a long time behavior. Okay. It's when the number of the players goes to plus infinity. Okay. Okay. Thank you. No, but uh, again, like I'm, I'm still not. Uh, I mean, when you send n to infinity, I understand how m is formed. M is the sum of those delta at x j. Yeah, actually, that, it can be obtained that, by this. Like how is u? How u is decided? What is u? How is u is related to v? I'm, I'm, I'm still not seeing how u is related to v. Yeah, I can do uh, a quick spoiler of what will happen, but actually u is uh, is strongly related with the master equation, and the master equation comes from the limit of v, but it is because uh, we will see uh, later well, but it is because that function v can be written in this way. And uh, with this writing, uh, it is not a function of n variable, but it is just on space and measure variable, this convergence to the solution of the master equation. So this is how it is related. It is not okay, really- Okay, so the u, the u will appear from-, from Yeah, okay, it will appear I from see. the master equation. Okay. And uh, and yes, because from the mean field games, yeah, it seems to be a little bit unrelated, but the master equation. So, so, so am I right here when I, when I say that the variable x in the mean field game in the here the variable x. Yeah. And the, the variable same. x that we had before, they are not the same. So here the variable. No, x... actually, this x is related to x i. Actually, to x i. Yeah, 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 yeah. The x is related to x i, but not to the. Uh, if you no, go not back, to the other the variable. Not to the other because variable. Because if you go back, let, let's go back. If you go back, yeah, here there is a variable x. So the x here. No, no, it's not the same. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's. Yeah, that's yeah, a little yeah. bit unfortunate thing, like in notations. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because. Uh... Because, yeah, because, uh, well, the notation for the space variable must be x, but actually uh, this x lies in a space which goes to plus infinity. So this symmetry allows, uh, allows to consider just a space variable and the dependence on the other place is just a measure variable. Okay, so uh, again with the master equation. So the master equation is a unique equation which summarizes the mean field game system. And to define the master equation, we consider the solution of the mean field game system at initial time t0 uh, and with an initial uh, density at the initial condition m0, which belongs to the set of Borel probability measures. The master equation is defined in this way as the value function of the mean field games at initial time. So it depends also, since the structure of the mean field games, it depends also on the initial condition on M. So it is a function, the master equation, which has a time dependence, a space dependence, and a measure dependence. Sorry, and, I have yeah. a question. So M, the system is backward forward. For M, you take M0. For U, it should, what we have, it's more U at T equal capital T. Well, for you, yeah, it is. Uh, no, I mean, small, small yeah. use. I mean, for Hamilton Jacobi equation, you have the, in, the, the final data, it's uh, you, uh, the initial data, it's u at t equal capital T. Yeah, exactly. For so the here, it's equation, like yeah. you are taking the, the final. The no, no, final... I'm taking here the initial. The final is always capital G. So I'm taking, I'm considered for the master equation the solution of the value function, the value function of the mean field games at initial time. Okay. Okay, okay so uh, if we compute the, at least formally, the equation satisfied by, couple, uh, by capital U using the equation of the mean field games, we obtain this backward hamilton jacobi equation, which is called uh, master equation. Actually, it is quite similar to a hamilton jacobi equation for the first three terms, but then we have, it is an infinite dimensional equation. And we have also this integral, those integrals depending on the measure variable. 
actually uh, here it is more clear why this looks like uh, the a Nash system, but I will be more precise about it later. So uh, here we have also a definition of DMU. Uh, DMU is uh, a suitable derivative of U with respect to the measure M and the derivative with respect to the measure variable will be defined later. Okay, so uh, in general, here we worked on RD and in general, the master equation is always approached uh, especially in the probabilistic literature with X in RD or in the analytic literature uh, with X in the torus to avoid the issues with boundary conditions. Um, but in many applied models, uh, boundary conditions turn out to be a crucial issue. And actually it is useful to work with a process that needs to remain in a certain domain of the existence, a certain bounded domain. This confinement can be obtained basically in two ways. The first way, which will, analyze, will be analyzed today, is to prescribe Neumann boundary conditions at the equation. This means that the trajectory of the players will have another term, which is a reflection process. It means that we put a wall, a barrier at the boundary, and if the process touch the boundary, touch the wall, it is reflected uh, it is pushed back inside the domain. Another way to obtain this confinement is to choose wisely the drift diffusion term and the diffusion, the drift term and the diffusion matrix in order to satisfy naturally the required restriction. In this case, we talk about invariance condition or state constraints, but it is beyond the aim of this talk. Uh, in this talk, I will be focused actually on the first aspect. Okay, so before starting, some references in the literature <coughs> about midfield game system. The literature in the midfield game system is huge, so I just want to refer to the people who started the, the theory. So Las Rie Lyons, as already said, in 2006, and independently in the same time by Wang, Kane, and Malamé. Uh, for, uh, as regards Neumann boundary condition, I want to refer to Ashdu, Bardi Cirant, uh, Alessio Porretta, Diogo Gomes, and about uh, finite state midfield games, so midfield games on networks. Uh, also, Ashdu, Daole, I, and Chu, and Fabio Camilli, Elisabetta Carlini, and, Nicola, and Claudio Marchi. As regards the master equation, its definition was given by Pierre Louis Lyons and Jean Michel Lasserie. Um, and uh, in its course, uh, the Collège de France. Uh, uh, Lyons gives the derivation of the master equation and the first result about the short time existence. And uh, there are a lot of results about uh, first order master equation without diffusion. First order means, uh, actually, to be more precise, I have to say what is first order master equation. The master equation that we analyze is a first order master equation. So for the master equation literature first order doesn't mean that there is no diffusion. First order means that there is no common noise. In the second order master equation, is there, an, uh, there is an additional term here, uh, which is a noise, a Brownian motion common for all the players. And the structure of the master equation becomes really intricate. So we are working now on the first order master equation, which was proved without a diffusion, with diffusion, uh, also, the second order mass equation was proved, but all these results are either in the torus or in the wall space. Uh, there is a result, uh, a result with absorption, so in a bounded domain, but absorption means basically uh, something with Dirichlet Neumann condition. And, uh, and I refer also to this, uh, to this literature for the convergence problem. Uh, in particular, the work, uh, uh, the pioneering work is the following one, both for master equation and convergence problem. The work of Cardaleghetti de la Rue Las Rielions, which worked in the torus and proved the first and second order will pose the of the master equation and convergence result. Okay, so. So, so what uh, you mean by convergence is really proving that 
uh, when n goes to infinity, you converge, the solution converges yeah, exactly. to the solution you have. It's a right? really convergence result, when n goes to plus infinity. Okay. So, uh, we give uh, a stochastic interpretation and equations involved just for now the game with Neumann boundary condition. So, uh, as before, the, uh, we want to analyze the asymptotic behavior of an n player's differential games, but now the dynamic is played in a closed bounded domain omega. The results are inspired by the ideas of the article I mentioned before, so Cardalieghe de la Rua de Lyons, but of course uh, it all has to be readapted in a framework of Neumann boundary condition and uh, a lot of issues uh, will appear and so there are many technicalities that needs to be handled in order to take care of the boundary. So the invariance of the domain, as already said, is obtained, is obtained adding a reflecting process at the boundary. So this is the new dynamic of the playwright, where there is this additional term, dKTI, where KTI is a reflected process along the conormal. So we refer to uh, uh, an old article of Leonces Nitzman to define this reflected process. You see that its variation occurs just when the trajectory hits the boundary. And in that case, the process is reflected inside the boundary uh, in the direction of the conormal. So ni is the outward normal and it is reflected inside because I have a minus sign here. So it is reflected uh, in the direction of the in inward normal. Okay, these reflections along the conormal forces the process to stay into omega for all time t. Okay, the Nash system in this case becomes the following. So the same Nash system as before, but we have these additional boundary conditions, uh, which are actually boundary conditions for all variables xj. So the, we have capital N boundary conditions uh, for the functions V and I. <coughs> Okay, uh, as before, uh, the solution of the master equation is obtained with exactly the same ideas. So we consider the solutions of the midfield games with the Neumann conditions, the same infield games as before, but with Neumann boundary conditions. And uh, if UM solves the midfield games with Neumann boundary conditions, again, with uh, uh, is, this is I am not a U, sorry, M at, in, at time T0 equals to M0. And um, we define the function u as the value function at initial time. And in this case, the master equation takes the following form. So the same master equation as before, but we have two boundary conditions. The first one is quite predictable, a boundary condition in the space variable, but we have also this other boundary condition is in the measure variable. And I emphasize this boundary condition because it is completely new in, in the literature. And it relies on the fact that actually we have to take care also of the boundary condition, not only in the space variable, but also in the measure variable. Actually, it's not that weird to have these boundary conditions because it is strongly related to the boundary conditions of the Nash system. And actually the Nash system and the master equation are closely related. <clears throat> Roughly speaking, this was uh, what I spoiled before, the symmetrical structure of the problem implies that actually the solution of the Nash system can be seen as a function which do not depend on i and uh, which depends on t and the dependence on the space variable is just uh, on the variable xi and the dependence for the other variable is on the empirical distribution of the other players. Hence, this means that uh, in the Nash system, we had boundary conditions for all the variables. So if we consider Neumann boundary condition for V and I in the variable Xi, well, the dependence on Xi is actually a space dependence. So it reflects in an, into a boundary condition for the space variable of capital U. The boundary condition with respect to xj, the dependence on xj is a measure dependence, dependence on the measure variable. And so it reflects in, in the master equation as a boundary condition in the measure variable. 
And I want also to emphasize that Nash system and master equation are related because of course this term, uh, this and this term and the F comes from this and this term and the F, but actually the additional term, so this term from the Nash system, when I when n goes to plus infinity, the sum becomes an integral. This derivative, I'm, der I'm differentiating v and i with respect to xj, so it is a measure, it becomes a measure derivative, and hp becomes hp. Here I'm differentiating v and j with respect to xj, so it is a space derivative in the master equation. And also this term, well, actually, this sum in J, when J is equal to I, this is a classical trace and a classical uh, D square X, X. And when I differentiate, when I take the sum with when J is different from I, the sum becomes an integral and the, uh, the Hessian becomes the derivative with respect to the measure variable. So uh, actually, it is Excuse me, Michael. Uh, more. Yeah. Uh, I, I, how how you explain physically the second boundary condition? I mean, the second the new man in in the probability measure. In the probability measure. Yeah, the the blue one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it depends on the uh, Neumann. Yeah, boundary. I mean physically. I mean physically. What does it mean? Well, it means actually that uh, uh, there is some kind of uh, the trajectory as change also if the other player, the trajectory of the player I as a change also if the other players uh, as reflect are reflected into the boundary because these reflections uh, is, um, how can I say, is a... Uh, it's a strong change of the trajectory, and it should mean that uh, there is some difference also in the in the for the master equation of another player. So it means it is a proof of the um, of the relation between all the players. So uh, a reflection of the other player means also a Neumann boundary conditions for the player I. You're welcome. So, okay. Um, so, so, so maybe I can ask you a question if you go just yeah, back. So, so this sort of interpretation, the, the, this slide, this sort of interpretation, how the how you go from the Nash to the master equation. Yeah. Uh, so this is rigorously done or there are still uh, pieces that Well, are actually not... the idea is the following one. Uh, it is not a rigorous proof of the convergence, but the proof, the rigorous proof of the convergence uses these ideas. So the yeah. ideas okay. are this one, but we have to define some auxiliary function. We will see that and uh, we, we need to be more precise. But actually, when we do the proof, this part will become this part and this mm -hmm. sum will become this integral. This remains. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So uh, before starting, some notations and derivatives. Uh, actually, there is a lot of preliminaries because, because the master equation needs a lot of preliminaries. And uh, OK, we defined omega as the closure of an open bounded set. In general, in PDE, omega is always taken as an open bounded set, but we need to work with Dirac masses at the boundary. So we need to have omega closed here with a smooth boundary. <clears throat> and we have to define some tools. We have to define a topology on the probability space uh, because we need to talk about the continuity of capital U with respect to the measure variable. We need to define a derivative of U with respect to M to give sense at the master equation. And we need to define some spaces of function which will be used. So the topology is defined from the uh, Wasserstein's distance. And uh, if we take M1 and M2 probability measure, uh, we define the water sense distance in this way. So as the supremum of this integral over the Lipschitz function. And uh, it 
can be proved that this distance set a topology on P of omega and allows to talk about continuity of U with respect to the measure variable. As regards the derivative, we need to introduce two notions of derivation. The first one is the following one. So if we have a function depending on a mes on measures, we say that U is of class C1 with respect to M. If there exists a continuous map, which is called actually the derivative, delta U over delta M, which depends on a measure variable and on an additional space variable, such that uh, for all measures M1 and M2, uh, we have that this limit, which actually is an incremental ratio in this direction, this limit is equal to, and this can be seen, this is an integral that can be seen actually as a scalar product in L2, in L2 between delta U over delta M and M2 minus M1, at least when M2 minus M1 has an L2 density. But this is because actually um, the, this uh, definition is uh, a generalization of the Frechet derivative of uh, U in L2. And it is generalized for all measure variables. And uh, since uh, this function with this definition is defined up to a constant, because if I had a constant here, uh, well, the integral of M2 minus M1 is equal to zero because they are measure variables. We, need, we adopt this normalization convention. <clears throat> then, uh, if delta U over delta M is of class C1 with respect to the space variable, so the additional variable, we define the intrinsic derivative of U with respect to M as uh, DMU as the gradient of delta U over delta M. And this derivative is what appears in the master equation. Okay. Then we need to give a suitable definition. Can you, can you ju just go back? Maybe you went too fast. So, uh, so the intrinsic. So I'm not seeing. So the intrinsic derivative. You are adding a derivative. I'm so doing what? a derivative, uh, a gradient of delta u over delta m. So a derivative in the space variable. Yeah, but why? Why are you adding this dy derivative here in that definition? Well, what actually, DMU, what, 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 what's the what's the logic of adding this dy there? Well, first of all, it's a technical because uh, uh, the derivative which appears in the master equation are these dmu, but actually it is related to uh, another incremental ratio where we do not add this, but we modify m with a push forward measure. Uh, uh -huh. So if I use uh, a phi push forward m and I do this one, I obtained the integral of phi uh, of dmu times phi or times the gradient of phi. I do not remember well, but it is related mm -hmm. with another incremental ratio with the push forward measure, and you obtain okay. exactly this. Okay. Okay. So uh, we need to define uh, uh, suitable definitions of the Banach space we will use. Uh, well, we use the notation Cn plus alpha to denote the space of function n times differentiable, actually Cn, and with all derivatives alpha older, and we uh, endow this space with the following norm. So the infinity norm of the gradients and uh, um, an older norm, of course, a older norm. And we need to work also of, on this subspace, Cn plus alpha n, the set of function that satisfies a Neumann boundary condition. So M stands for Neumann, <coughs> a Neumann boundary condition, and it is endowed with the same norm. And uh, in the same way, we can define uh, the parabolic spaces. Uh, and this will be the parabolic space we, we will use um, uh, in this talk. Then we need to work also uh, in the dual space because the Fokker-Planck equation is always approached in duality. So we define the dual space of Cn plus alpha as C minus N plus alpha, and it is endowed with the classical norm of dualities, so the supremum of rho against phi. And uh, in the same way, we can define the, the dual space of Cn plus alpha n. And we adopted this notation, just putting a minus before. 
Okay, these are the main hypotheses we use in this presentation. So uh, we need to work with smooth functions. To approach the master equation, we need uh, some regularity. So A is uniformly elliptic, is also C1 plus alpha. H is smooth. Lipschitz and strictly convex, uh, Lipschitzianity and strictly convexity are just required with, the last, with respect to the last variable. F and G must be smooth. Non-decreasing in the last variable, actually this non-decreasingness is uh, uh, what we need to have uniqueness of the mean field game system. And, uh, and we need that these norm are bounded. Uh, so we have that F must be also differentiable C1 with respect to the measure variable. Actually also this Lipschitz bound in the measure for delta F over, over delta M must be satisfied. And the same estimates satisfied by G but stronger, so uh, actually, sorry, not one plus alpha, alpha replaced by two plus alpha. This, this alpha and this other one replaced by two plus alpha. Okay, and then we require that uh, the, these Neumann boundary conditions are satisfied. Some comments about uh, this Neumann boundary condition. Well, the last one is a classical one, is a compatibility condition to have smooth solutions for the midfield game system and the master equation. Uh, so if we require Neumann boundary condition for you, also at final time, this Neumann boundary condition needs to be satisfied and then G must satisfy Neumann boundary condition. These are a little bit weird. Can you, can you just go back to the definition of the norms, the alpha and two comma uh, two plus alpha? Yeah, okay, yeah. This okay. One. Yeah, yeah, because now this one, this one is like the n plus alpha. Okay, this is n plus alpha, but yeah, then you have another one alpha. where you have you have two indices. You have alpha and two plus alpha. Yeah, oh, that, that's for of course alpha for the uh, t variable uh, for the first variable x and two plus alpha for the second variable y. Uh, yeah, because ah. for f. And G, yeah, because we okay, have so the alpha here alpha. means in uh, in time, and two plus alpha no, means no, no. in uh... it's not time because f depends in the oh, space, no. but delta f over delta m is a, another space variable which comes from the, the definition of delta oh, f over right, delta right. m. So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's the two the two variables like yeah, x the and two y. Spaces variables. So x and y. Exactly. Oh. And uh, as regards these kind of a weird boundary conditions. Uh, these are uh, required, these are some technical assumptions that are required uh, because we will need to work with some uh, linearized mean field game system. And actually these are mandatory to obtain the C1 character of U with respect to M. I will say precisely in the slides when these boundary conditions are required. So we want to prove the well positedness of the master equation. I want to rewrite the master equation, the following one. And the main theorem of today is the following one. So we suppose that the main hypothesis are satisfied. Then there exists a unique classical solution of U of the master equation. And uh, I want to give just an idea of the proof because an, a, a heuristic proof, a formal proof can be done quite easily. So uh, we consider U as the value function at initial time of the mean field game system. Then we can write the derivative of U as the sum of these two limits. Actually the incremental ratio is just this minus this minus, sorry, minus this one, minus u t0, t0 x m0. I add and subtract this quantity to analyze separately these two limits. Because the second one, this for definition is u t0 x. This actually, uh, since I shifted also the initial measure, this is u of uh, small u of t0 plus h x. So this is the incremental ratio of u, and this is actually just the derivative of u. And I can use the mean field game system and the definition of the master equation to have this term equals to this, which is a part of the master equation. 
For this one, uh, I don't want to spend the tails, but it is not that difficult. We use the, using the C1 regularity of U, which needs to be proved. But uh, uh, for now, formally, using the C1 regularity of U with respect to M and also the boundary condition, uh, we can, uh, we have here an increment just in the measure. So we can use actually the regularity, the definition of delta U over delta M. And uh, we have, uh, we obtain this integral, which are the integrals in the master equation. If we put together the pieces, we obtain uh, the, um, the existence of the solution of the master equation. Actually, this is a formal proof, but it becomes rigorous if I have the regularity required for U. So uh, we need to prove that U is regular in the space variable, in the measure variable. This is all uh, we have to do just this, because the proof is that, and it becomes rigorous if we have uh, this regularity, which is the toughest part, the most difficult part. Prove that U is C1 with respect to M. Also, we need to prove that delta U over delta M is twice differentiable in the last variable, because we have uh, here the term uh, gradient of DMU, and the gradient to DMU is another gradient in the last variable, in the, in the Y variable. So it is actually an Hessian matrix of delta U over delta M. And also we need to prove that boundary conditions for U are satisfied. Okay, some preliminary results. So about the regularity of mean field games with Neumann conditions, these are well-known results that uh, uh, with this hypothesis, we have a smooth solution for the value uh, mean field game system, smooth for the, the value function, and actually uh, it satisfies a holder condition in the space, in the time variable uh, with respect to the Wasser size distance for the measure variable. And actually we have also a stability result. So if I have two solutions of the mean field game system with different initial condition M0 and M tilde zero, we can prove that these two solutions are close if the two distances, the two initial conditions are close in the Wasserstein sense. Okay, and uh, we have to prove uh, uh, the existence of this derivative. We have to prove the C1 character of U. What is the idea? Well, the idea is to uh, consider the equation satisfied by U minus U tilde and then minus M tilde, because actually at initial time, U minus U tilde is U of M zero minus U of M tilde zero. And we want to linearize this equation. And uh, if we linearize this equation, we obtain the following system, which is called the linearized system. And we have a linearized the hamilton jacobi equation. So the same hamilton jacobi equation, but now this term is linear. And it depends on the derivative of f with respect to m. And uh, we have also a linear Fokker-Planck equation and uh, with uh, Neumann boundary conditions satisfied, actually we have these additional terms in red, these remainders, if we want. Uh, there are some remainders from the linearization and actually if M0 and F tilde zero are close, these remainders are small. <coughs> what is the idea? Why we need to linearize this system? Because we want to prove that delta U over delta M exists and it is actually the solution of uh, the value function at initial time of this linearized system when where rho zero is equal to the Dirac masses at y and the other remainders are equal to zero. We will work very often with this system. So uh, we use this notation, we call general linearized system, this one, and the pure linearized system, the system with these those three remainders equal to zero. Okay, we need to assume some regularity for ZT, for rho zero, for H and for C. And uh, we have this regularity result. So we know that if our hypotheses are satisfied, there exists a unique solution of the uh, general linearized system where Z is a classic solution 
and rho actually is continuous in time, but it is a distributional solution. So it lies in this uh, dual space. And we know that uh, the solution is bounded by uh, the norm of the remainders. Okay, to prove this theorem, actually, uh, the Neumann boundary conditions required before for delta G and delta F are crucial. Why? Because actually, if rho is in this space, this means that rho uh, can be evaluated just with function which shall satisfy Neumann boundary conditions. This means that here, I use this notation to talk about the evaluation of rho against delta F over delta M and rho against delta G over delta M. And since rho has this regularity, this means that delta F over delta M and delta G over delta M must be in C1 plus alpha N. And so must satisfy Neumann boundary conditions. Uh, actually, it is not possible to obtain a result, uh, at least as far as I know, it is not possible to obtain uh, this result with C minus one plus alpha. So put Neumann boundary condition is, is mandatory here because it's a compatibility condition to have some regularity result. But I don't want to go into details from this proposition. proposition, just want to say, that here the Neumann boundary conditions are crucial. And this estimates allows us to prove the following theorem, which is the most important theorem maybe, because uh, uh, if the hypothesis are satisfied, now we know that U is C1 with respect to M, and actually that the boundary conditions holds true. The Neumann boundary condition in the measure variable, well, the one in the space variable is quite obvious, but the one in the measure variable needs to be proved. Okay. I give a little sketch of the proof just of this theorem. And we prove that, uh, we start proving that the linearized, the pure linearized system admits a fundamental solution. So it means that there exists a function K such that Z at initial time can be written as uh, the measure rho zero against K. <coughs> then we consider the couple u tilde minus u minus z and m tilde minus m minus rho. I recall that u and m and u tilde m tilde were solution of the mean field game system with initial condition m0 and m tilde 0. z and rho are solution of the pure linearized system with rho 0 equals to m tilde 0 minus m0. We prove that this couple solves a general linearized system. And using the bounds we know on the general linearized system, we know that the norm of this, we just need the norm of this. Well, at initial time, U tilde is actually capital U evaluated at M tilde zero. Small u is capital U evaluated at M zero. And for this, uh, for this, um, for the fundamental solution character, we know that Z is the integral of k against rho zero, which in this case is m tilde zero minus m zero. This quantity is bounded by the norm of the remainders. And we can prove that the norm of the remainders is bounded by is bounded from above by this quantity. This is a sort of a Taylor expansion, first order Taylor expansion in the measure variable. So with these estimates, we can prove that u is c1 with respect to m and that actually k is delta u over delta m. And uh, to obtain the boundary condition in the measure variable, uh, we consider the solution, again, a solution of the linearized, of the pure linearized system with rho zero is the derivative uh, in, of the Dirac masses in the distributional sense and in the conormal direction. And we want to prove that the solution of this linearized system satisfies Z equal to zero. Since Z is linear, uh, this red reduces to prove that actually the data of uh, Z are linear because the system of Z is the following one with H and Z equal to zero. To have the solution zero, we, we have to prove that this and this are equal to zero. And this again can be proved using the boundary conditions, the hypothesis on F, on delta F over delta M and delta G over delta M. 
So we prove that these are zero. And uh, this concludes the proof because actually this boundary condition can be written as DMU is the gradient of delta U over delta M in the direction of A ni. A is a symmetric matrix, so it can be put here. And it is actually uh, the product of, uh, it is actually delta U over delta M against the derivative of the Dirac masses uh, in this direction, which is actually rho. And for definition, since this is the uh, fundamental solution, this is actually Z and Z is equal to zero. Okay, and uh, the last thing uh, uh, to prove is that it's just the regularity of delta U over delta M because we need that delta U over delta M is C2 actually. It's twice differentiable in the last variable to give sense at the, at the gradient of the MU, which appears in the master equation. And uh, this can be done because the regularity of delta U over delta M is closely related to the regularity of rho. So far, we have a regularity of rho in C minus one plus alpha. This implies a regularity of delta U over delta M is C one plus alpha. And improving the estimates from C minus one plus alpha to C minus two plus alpha, we can prove actually that delta U over delta M is in C2 plus alpha. And this allows us, now we have uh, the C1 character of U, we have the regularity needed for delta U over delta M, we have uh, the boundary conditions satisfied, so the well posed, the formal proof of the well posed result becomes rigorous, and we have the solution of the master equation. Okay, to conclude, I have a few minutes to talk about the convergence problem. Because once we have the solution of the master equation, uh, we want to use it to uh, approximate, to prove uh, uh, the convergence of the M players differential games. So the idea is to consider the solutions of the Nash system. And we also want to consider these auxiliary functions, which are obtained from the master equation. So I defined U and I as capital U evaluated at xi and the empirical distribution. And what do we want to prove? We want to prove that uni and bni are close if the number of the player is sufficiently large. So um, we have, uh, uh, using the regularity of u, especially in the measure variable, actually in the space variable, we know that uh, since u is smooth in time, and in Xi, this means that U and I will be smooth in time and in Xi. But since U is also smooth in the measure variable, we can prove also some regularity of uh, U and I in the other variables. So we can prove that the Xj, the U and I exists and it is equal to this quantity. We also can prove that the gradient of Xi, Xj exists. Actually, I just have to compute the gradient in X of this function. We can also prove that uh, almost always uh, it, it exists uh, the second derivative of X G, of U and I with respect to X, J, X, J, and uh, it is close to this quantity when N is large. Okay, and uh, using these representations formula and the equation satisfied by U, we obtain that actually U and I is almost a solution of the Menesh system because we can prove that U and I satisfies the Nash system uh, with this remainder. And a remainder which is small in the L infinity sense if the number of the players is large. Okay, this is a first, uh, uh, first idea of this uh, approximation with the master equation. Uh, but to prove the main theorem, we consider the optimal dynamic uh, yt of the M player system, which starts from M0. So we have uh, a family of independent, identically distributed random variables of low M0, which is called Z, and we consider the optimal trajectories. So we have an initial condition Z, Zi, and we have actually the same, uh, the system, the stochastic system, the SDE, where we replace the drift function, which 
uh, with its feedback form, which is given by uh, the gradient of the Hamiltonian. It can be proved that uh, the drift is given by the gradient of the Hamiltonian uh, in the optimal path. Okay, so uh, what we can prove, we can prove that if many hypotheses hold, then uh, these two gradient, the gradient of VNI and UNI computed at the optimal trajectories are close in the L2 norm. And also UNI and VNI evaluated in Z at the initial time, here also there is a T0, are close, are smaller than C over N, PL most surely. This means that actually the functions U and I approximate the optimal control in L2. So can give an approximation of the optimal control. So the Nash equilibria can be approximated using the master equation. And uh, the idea of the proof is to estimate this quantity. So the difference of the square using the Ito's formula and the equation satisfied by U and I and V and I. Then with some applications of the Gronwall lemma, we can prove that these inequalities hold true. Okay, this is interesting by itself because it gives this approximation of the Nash equilibria, but it is also a tool to prove the main theorem of this last part, which is the following one. So we suppose that the main hypothesis hold true. Uh, if we define the MXN as the empirical distribution of the old player, we can prove actually that VNI minus U evaluated at this empirical distribution of the old player, these two quantities are small uh, when n goes to plus infinity. And then a pure convergence result. If we define WNI as uh, the integral of VNI, uh, where we compute the integral in the other variable with low uh, m0, and then we can prove that actually the limit of WNI when n goes to infinity is exactly u of m. Uh, in this L1 of M norm. To conclude, uh, just a last result with the convergence of the optimal trajectories, because if I consider an approximated optimal trajectory, just replacing VNI by UNI, be careful because this is different from that, from this one, because here I have UNI, but evaluated at the optimal trajectory Y, now I put here x and I solve the stochastic differential equation. So I want to solve the stochastic differential equation, changing VNI by UNI. And uh, I can prove that uh, the supremum of this quantity, so this quantity are close in the L2 norm. This actually uh, was proved differently. It's quite easy in the article of cardalia uh, because uh, uh, it can be proved just uh, uh, doing the difference of XTI minus YTI and computing the Ito's formula, because uh, their uh, sigma was equal to one. Uh, their sigma was equal to one, so this difference comes uh, because uh, becomes zero. There is no this. Uh, there is no uh, reflection. So actually the difference is just the difference of the Hamiltonians and the result is quite easy. Here we need to take care also of this, of the stochastic term and the reflection process. So the idea is to apply Ito's formula to another quantity, which actually depends on the distance of XTI and YTI from the boundary. And we do not have exactly XTI minus YTI square, but we need to modify with uh, the inverse of the uh, matrix A. Okay, I think I ran out of time. Uh, the open problems is the master equation is a, in a framework of invariance condition or state constraints. So the other way to obtain invariance, but the main problem here is the lack of regularity at the boundary because we need to work with bounded solutions and with the smooth solutions and we do not have the smoothness for invariance conditions or state constraints. And as regards master equation with Dirichlet boundary conditions, uh, uh, the ideas are pretty the same, pretty much the same. Uh, and it is also a preprint work that I did with uh, Luca Di Persio and Matteo Garbelli. And that's it. So thank you. Thank you, Michele, for the nice talk.
So we pass to the audience for the question. Please, any question, please? Maybe I will start. Okay. Yeah. So uh, here we are taking the Hamiltonian is separable. So if you consider here the, I mean for the master equation you take the Hamiltonian it's it's uh, it's non separable. Non separable. You means that the results are dependent on m. Yeah. Okay. HD. Well, this becomes more complicated. But actually, it could be done, but uh, we need to have uh, already results for the mean field games or with this Hamiltonian depending on M. Uh, well, this is, yes, this is useful because it can uh, give uh, some models for congestion problems. But uh, we need results for the mean field games, so smooth results for the mean field games with Neumann conditions and with an Hamiltonian which depends on M. And I'm not aware if the, these results are available. So for Neumann? the study of the mass equation could be a second step. First, uh, there must be done a study of the mean field games with these separable, um, non-separable Hamiltonians. Yeah, I and think then, it was done. It was done by Sebastian. Uh, okay. Well, if it is was done, if it was done even with Neumann boundary conditions, yeah, maybe the idea can be readapted. The main idea is always the following, and maybe it can be a readaptation. So of course, we need some hypothesis on H. So this non-decreasingness on, on F must be translated to H, but maybe the idea could work also for this problem. And also I think Alpar and uh, Ambrosi, they have a paper in master equation for no separable mean field games, I think. Ah, okay, okay. And it is interesting in the Taurus, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, I think in the Taurus, yeah. Okay, okay, well, in general, uh, if in the torus is done, uh, I think that the main difficulty to Neumann conditions is overcome with this talk in general. So these are the ideas, and I think these ideas can be readapted also in case of non separable with Neumann conditions. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any more question, please? Okay, so let's uh, let's thank Michele for the nice talk. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so well, if there is no more, uh, we can say goodbye. Yeah.